Welcome to what? That old queen? A candid and adult take on queer life quandaries at a certain age. So please listen at your own discretion. Presented by Bernie and Tommy, the views here are purely those of the content providers and in no way reflect those of any service you may hear this program on. Now, please at your ears be upstanding for the <coughs> old queen. Season two. Ooh. So when the apocalypse arrives, yeah, do you think that me and you would just be sat here drinking Sauvignon Blanc? <laughs> well, I think we need to stock up on Sauvignon Blanc. Um, yeah, you know, and I think we owe it to our listeners to be to keep them company. You know, when they're, they could be self isolating. Yeah, when they're self isolating, yeah. you know, we could we could just be. Guests. Yeah, guests in their home, <laughs> yeah. talking the usual nonsense mm. <laughs> that we talk. <laughs> so this season, there's going to be more of the same, but also some extra bits, and some of the same bits are going to be different bits. Yeah. I've come up with my very own feature. And tell us about this feature, Tommy. Well, it's called What That Really Old Queen. <laughs> So I'm going to be delving into history mm. um, and telling you a little bit about some historical people that I found out about that have a queer um, reading. I think when you're talking about like people from the past in history, it's always quite difficult to place a kind of clear identity, of a gay identity, like as we know it, because there wasn't a gay identity. Then. No. It wasn't a lifestyle like it is now. So it's it's a bit more of a grey area, but it actually makes it much more interesting. Yeah, mm. definitely. Mm. Okay, that's that's great. So I'm, we're going to do one of those today, aren't we? We are. Yeah, we're going to do. I've got it lined up. What that old older queen? Um, what that really old queen? What that really old queen? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> makes me feel young. Yeah. <laughs> this one is really old. <laughs> that I've got great. <laughs> I love that. Um, and we've got some guests mm. who will be coming in this season. Uh, we've got one lined up called uh, John Thomas, who's an old friend of ours. And he's now uh, a porn star, amongst mm. other things. So we can talk to him about his colourful life. Looking then, forward to that. But we've also got... So Kinky Blink is changing. I might mm. change the name to What That Old Kink. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's going to have a historical vein as well. Okay, sometimes. so we're slowly moving into... Yeah, because yeah. I think, well, obviously, it's our USP, isn't it? I would say, like, history light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the light entertainment of history. Yeah. <laughs> Never knowingly, rigorously researched. <laughs> Never knowingly, exactly. And uh, we got Schnack out of it. I know, I've had a glimpse of that. Which is going to have a different twist. Sometimes it will be just snacks, but I'm going to try and cook stuff for us as well. Mm. Um, well, did you notice that my table is now being um, levelled out because the legs are uneven by a Nigel Slater cookery book? Oh. <laughs> he could be an old queen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I might need to use that cookery book at some... Well, so. the table will be uneven, okay. but... Yeah, right. you're welcome. Great. And of course, we've still got Queens of Agony. Mm. And I've got, a tr I've got a really long letter for you today. Oh, great. As well. Well, I can't so wait to get my teeth into that. You, you can get your teeth into that. But what would you like to start off with? Should we, should we start off with what that really old queen? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So my really old queen um, dates back to 1573. So that's quite old. Yeah, that's only two years before I was born. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he is the Earl of Southampton, or Henry Rosenlee. Right. Um, so 
people might know of him because uh, William Shakespeare of the Royal Shakespeare Company right. um, penned a few sonnets um, in uh, honour of um, Southampton, of the Earl of Southampton. Right. One of them you might know was, um, Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day? Do you know that one? Yes, I do yeah. know that one. And um, the Earl of Southampton, Henry, was um, a very beautiful young man. Right. And there's a series of William Shakespeare's sonnets, and I think they're called The Fair Youth or The Fair Lord. They're a kind of um, series of sonnets right. that he dedicated to the Earl. And he's kind of like got this long mane of beautiful reddy auburn hair, very androgynous looking, very delicate features and beautiful manicured pretty hands right. um, in the painting. Um, and Have we got pictures? We have got pictures, okay. yeah. Um, we flick through them and you can almost like look at him through... Well, he lived from 1573 to 1624. So... How old was it? So how old is he when he died? So he kind of, like, died around 50. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) But people did. But people did then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he he probably had quite a good innings, really. Yeah. Um, I think one of my favourite sonnets is the one that goes, "A, a woman's face with nature's hands, a hand painted. Do you know that one? No. Hast thou the master and the mistress of my passion, which kind of explores the kind of very androgynous side of Henry in this painting. Right. Apparently his mother, his mother was trying to force him to get married and Henry was having none of it at this age. Yeah, um, and so they got Shakespeare in. At this point, everyone, there was the Spanish Armada, everyone was sick of plays mm. and so Shakespeare had to kind of um, adapt and became like a tutor this is my oh, okay. reading of it and he was um, procured for um, to be the tutor of Henry and the mother said oh I want you to write 17 sonnets for Henry for his 17th birthday um, so that's my Henry, really. Okay, and yeah. so um, the link to another link to Shakespeare is Shakespeare did the Seven Ages of Man. Yes, didn't he? Lovely and, that one. And the three pictures that we have of Henry are like the three ages of gay. Yeah. So <laughs> we've got Twink, Jock, yeah. and uh, Bear. <laughs> yeah, like old older Bear. Yeah. Yeah, older Otter. Yeah. yeah. So Henry does it eventually end up marrying a, a woman and right. they have three children. But like I was saying before, like it's quite it's quite hard to actually articulate to say like this person was gay. Right. Um and I think this is a really good example of that. What are the clues other than the sonnets? Um and the beauty. Well, I like to think it's the beauty is the <laughs> it's the sure giveaway. Um <laughs> and I think that Shakespeare was sort of appealing to maybe Henry's vanity side. And actually when we're talking about Henry, we're probably more talking about we're actually probably more talking about the like question that a lot of academics have thought about that that spend a lot of time with Shakespeare is like was actually Shakespeare gay because he was rumored to have lots of affairs with women and be a great admirer of um of male youth yeah yeah well he sounds like he's a bit bi to me yeah so i think that that that, that there is a lot of um Ambiguity. Ambiguity, but there's also a lot of material that can support that argument. Yeah. What do you think about Shakespeare? I think he's gay because the way that he writes um, about um, male uh, friendship and compassion, and and actually also he writes in Troilus and Cressida about Patroclus and Achilles, and they were, you know... Yes. Gay together for a, a great many <laughs> years. Have you read uh, the book Song of Achilles? No. Um, that's a really good book that I read last year, actually. Okay. Um, which kind of explores that gay relationship. But, it, I mean, he was a big fan of the Greeks and well, Romans yeah. who were all a bit, you know. Yeah. And all of his plays actually always are based in in the past. But Ooh. his sonnets are very different because they are actually speaking 
through his voice in a current period or a contemporary period for that time. Yeah. Obviously, Shakespeare is very important to our culture mm. and uh, particularly the theatre. Do you think too much onus is put on Shakespeare in a way? I think that the stories are endlessly fascinating and the characters are just brilliant. Yeah. Um, so, so not really, although I'm sure that there's so many other playwrights that we have forgotten about because, yeah. like, there's been this momentum. And I have um, had a residency in Stratford when I initially was asked to make up this work and it's all just a bit tenuous. Like, this is the floor that Shakespeare's sister <laughs> might have stepped on at one point. We don't know that for a fact. Well, the pop band. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shakespeare's sister was, you know, uh, an important woman. So that's well, why. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Smith's title yeah. of a Smith song. <laughs> yeah. right. As I say, never knowingly, um, historically, r rigorously researched <laughs> this material. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah you can fact check us yeah. and um, we don't really care yeah. so <laughs> so can we can we just so we'll post up pictures of Henry yeah on our Instagram we'll do the three stages I we'll think. do the three yeah. stages of gay yeah, yeah. Um, do you feel that you've gone through the three stages of gay yet well I've definitely been the twink mm. um, I would say I, I was a twonk now um, which is... I don't really know what a twonk is. What's a is twonk? like someone that used to be a twink that's middle-aged now. Oh, OK. I don't really see myself being a sort of mature bear because I'm just not built that way. No. But, but he's seen quite thin. He just has, like, very pronounced... Well, he's got a big beard, hasn't he? He's got he? a lovely kind mm. of, like, moustache and yeah. beard, isn't he? Very yeah. pointy. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely sort of grown into his looks. And do you know what else I love about that time period is that the dress, particularly for men, was quite flamboyant mm. as well. And I feel that that's something that we need to bring back. Well, we also need to bring back the roughs because right? with the coronavirus currently, <laughs> we're all desperate to, like, we're so, you just did it then. We touch our faces all the yes. time. So imagine we have a beautiful big rough. I think that would... It'd stop that it. Would, yeah, and it would help yeah. us. To, the, the, I quite like the spread a rough of infection and those big wigs. Well, you can mix it up. Mix it up. <laughs> the, well, there was the big wigs, and then there was like the the white wigs with the beauty Powder spots. Yeah. yeah, I could do that. Yeah, it's like I mean, it's so interesting, isn't mm. it? What? How did they come about with all of this stuff? Well, the. The powdered face was a bit to cover all the kind of the leprosy sores. and sores. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which, yeah. <laughs> Which maybe so, we yeah, don't... still need now, <laughs> some of us. Uh, okay. Well, that, well, that's good. Well, we're going to stay on a historical theme because I've done a little bit of research mm. for Kinky Blink. Uh, I was looking for like historical kinky artifacts or sex artefacts, really. And I came across this um, website called Photostras, and they've got a whole feature. I'll put a link in the description to this. And it's uh, inside the Sex Machines Museum in Prague. Okay. And um, it's got some quite interesting stuff because it goes from, like, early ages. Obviously, there's quite a lot of kink stuff there. But also, do you remember the final episode of the last where we went uh, for Edward the Seventh, Edward the Sixth, or something like that? Who's Victoria's sex chair. Son, yeah, son, yeah, the yeah. sex chair. Well, they've got a copy of this sex chair in the museum, but above it. So is it reconstruction? Well, I don't know if it's a reconstruction or what. It doesn't really say very much about in the article. I think the reconstruction was in. The museum in Paris, but this is the genuine article. Pretty much exactly the same. Mm. So I don't know if it was just a copy, but these they've got instructions on how to use it. Is it the kind of museum? Because a lot of museums are now moving into a way that you can touch the articles and you can kind of sit on the chairs. 
and um, oh. enjoy the like <laughs> the, you know it's not in the National Trust houses now you, you can no go longer and have a threesome yeah well <laughs> I think this is the next level okay. next stage <laughs> like there's no longer roped off p- areas you're supposed to kind of enjoy the settings oh okay do so you think that's... we could go over there and have a bit of a play well, I don't know I think we should uh, we should ask them really shouldn't we and and have a look but what it also goes into which. I don't think we've gone into in Kinky Blink before, is um, BDSM, which is BDSM. Do you know what BDSM stands for? I don't know what it stands for. Something to do with what, BDSM, the... Marks and Spencers? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't any old whip. It's an M&S whip. Um, BDSM? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> they are our new sponsors, so thanks for getting them in on this episode. So... Bondage, dominance, sadism, masochism. So there's nothing submissive about that then, is there? I would have thought that that was part of it as well. Um, It was like an all-encompassing term. Bondage, dominance, sadism. I mean, I guess it's covered in that book. I I guess it is. But but all of these things are different things. So bondage Mm. means the art to tie people. Mm. That is to say, for pleasure aesthetic or restriction people can be tied up with ropes chain iron or handcuffs dog leads dog leads i'm sure there's i've had that done before there's there's plenty of i mean there's there's some very odd looking i mean they look like chastity belts don't they they do yeah but they've got teeth kind of scary uh and uh, holes for every orifice so but i mean we've touched on this rope and being tied up before discipline means disciplinary or being disciplined by a person for various purposes discipline usually goes beyond a simple relationship of domination because to reinforce the desired behavior change we need to manipulate the person being coached and make it push the boundaries that's why i've got that covered under the stairs (laughs) (laughs) is your puppy in there it could be a good one i think it's just got enough space yeah yeah check the bike out yeah so if there's any puppies that want to come and play in your kennel, mm. we'd be up for that. We'd record it. Uh, so dominance and submission is the dynamic relationship where a person submits to another and this person takes control of the situation. This is the case of a person who lets someone else tie, humiliate, be, do things for goals that may or may not be sexual. Is it, is it can also connect? I'm always fascinated by people that like to be sort of financially humiliated Ooh. have you come across that before i think we did that in the christmas episode didn't we where people... <laughs> well that was a appropriate <laughs> slot yeah it was like the kinky blink of the christmas episode where um yeah financial dominance is a thing is santa a but, victim of that but, well or, i think santa's uh, the, the daddy of that isn't yeah. he <laughs> He's coming to give you presents, but he expects something in return. Maybe that's why I've got a thing about Santa. Maybe it is why you've got something about Santa. So, um, sadism is when a person takes pleasure in causing pain on someone else. Mm. In BDSM, we can use the word sadist to highlight people who like a kind of safe sex consented where they can cause pain in your partners. Mm. I guess that's when you have a safe word, isn't it? Mm when it gets a bit too much Mm. my um this guy that i see which i refer to as sexy jeff um he likes to bite my cheeks oh and um (laughs) which cheeks (laughs) (laughs) well not my face cheeks okay right (laughs) but he likes to go in quite hard and i've had to have a word and say it's too much Yes, mm. uh, because, yeah, I had a little... It's painful. Um, I mean, I know it's supposed to be, but it's too painful. Yeah, I had an FB who was who was into a lot of kinky stuff and used to bite me a lot, mm. ev- kind of everywhere. Mm. And and one time it left like a scar and I was mm. like, you can't... No, it's too you much. You literally can't yeah. do that because yeah. that is too much. Moving on. Masochism is the opposite of sadism. It's when someone likes to receive pain. So I guess that's what you were talking about okay, before. Yeah. yeah. And they also, maybe they would be the person that likes to be financially humiliated? Yes. Mm. In BDSM, masochist is only a person who takes pleasure in pain. And this is not necessarily erotic. 
BDSM has no exact definition and as a subculture covers many practices and fetishes that do not quite fit the acronym. This is the case of people who are obsessed for feet or lovers of leather clothing for example it doesn't matter what your gender color class or creed is you can be whatever you want change roles your preferences are the limit mm. well it may like immediate like obviously it's all encompassing and lots of people have that as part of their daily lives mm. but immediately i'm transported to thinking about you know that's personal services with Cynthia Payne <laughs> and all those politicians and that sort of thing. It just makes me think of that, really. Well, yeah. It's, so that's my immediate frame of reference. And I think it's always, in many respects, it's been uh, like the realm of public school. Yeah, so I like think that, it's like, it? I, I think it must come like, there must be some connection between the public school process. Well, it's boarding schools yeah. and also, uh, and well, and they're constantly being humiliated, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, well, now you see it uh, in porn uh, where it's hazing and things mm. like that in like universities in America because um, they have different houses, don't mm. they? So I imagine that sort of thing was going on behind closed doors mm. in public schools and, mm. and that's where they got a preference for it. Mm. Um, but now everyone's getting on the act because um, it's quite fun to mix it yeah. up and, and play with these things. You don't have to be upper class to be a sadist. You, you don't have to be rich <laughs> to be a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Although it helps. <laughs> But, yeah, anyway, um, we, we might do more on this Prague Museum. Yeah, well, maybe we can... The Sex Machines muse Museum. I quite like to look at... I, I quite like to see a video of how some of these sex machines work. Maybe we can go over there. Yeah, or, or interview someone mm. from it. Or maybe one of our guests has even been to... Mm. I have been to Prague, but I didn't know there was a sex machine museum. Mm. Otherwise, I would have gone. What were your Prague highlights? I went to the opera... <gasps> Oh, very nice. For 75p. Wow. Which was ridiculously cheap. But it's quite a big thing over there, the opera, because people dress up for it. Mm. So I felt quite underdressed. Do you remember what you were wearing? Mm, probably what I, pretty much what I'm wearing now. Mm. <laughs> Whereas other people were in tuxedos <laughs> and ball gowns and look, looking down their nose at me. Mm. But I was at the theatre last night and I had a lovely seat. Yeah. And I really felt... There was just this... Re like, partly, there was just this... Well, it was press night, so it was opening night, had a really great seat, mm. and there was something about the atmosphere, and the artistic director of the Bristol Orbit came on stage and was like, um, so this is the opening night, um, one of the actors is sick, um, so we've got an understudy in, she's like a local woman, um, actually I know her, right. but we, they only got her in like that afternoon to do it. Wow. And, and I think the coronavirus kind of helped the excitement because everyone was like, well, yeah, we're going to make a decision to step out and see this show. Yeah. And it just felt really like alive and electric, like that whole, oh, like the anticipation of a, of a theatrical event felt really... Amazing. Yeah, great. It the show was a bit disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Was it about coronavirus or not? No, but there was oh. one moment. So it was about um, sort of a witch that travels through time. Mm. And yeah, she was talking about viruses at one point and there was a lot of looking around. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting. We live in very strange times at the moment with this mm. coronavirus. I don't know whether people are going a bit over the board with it or not. It's very difficult to tell. Yeah. So. Because, you know, I, I, I guess you have the same experience of living on your own and I can yeah. listen to Radio 4 and the news and it's all just about that. And so when I step outside, I have this feeling that everyone's going to be like not there or hiding or something. It's but then life ca just carries on. Yeah. But then po people were posting from London today with like pictures of all the hot tourist spots saying no one was there. Right. So I think people are retreating. Well, we're still going to be here. Yeah. So we're going to be here to keep you company. Yeah. And lift your spirits and forget about coronavirus for a while. And on that note, uh, we're going to have a quick break. Right. We'll see you after this.
that old catwalk. Uh, anyway, we're back, and um, Tommy, we've, we've had a little break. Yes. So what have you been up to? Well, recently I had my 21st birthday. You did, yeah. which was fantastic. Yeah. I came along and it was an amazing night of variety mm. performances. So it's my 21 years of work life. Yeah. Yeah, and I've had performers there that I've been working with over that period. Yes. And some of them were roasting me. Yes. Uh, Scotty did a very good roast. Yeah. It was uh, lovely. For you. And I'm doing the Mayfest podcast this year, so I need to interview lots of performers for that. So I might nick some of those interviews for this as well. Yeah. And Scotty is one of the people that we want to interview. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, looking forward to Mayfest because there's loads of stuff coming on. So have a look at the Mayfest website. Yeah, if... and come see the Major Arcana, which is my tarot card show. Oh. It's part of it. Right. So we do a live tarot reading and then we do a performance for that that person that has their card read. Right. Inspired by their future usually, but sometimes we focus on their past or the present. Yeah. Are you, do you identify with any of the major arcanas personally? Uh, well, we ha- we so there's a there's a kind of core group of eight of us, I think, eight performers, and we take on some of the cards ourselves. Um, so I had I do the I always do the sun, right? I mean that's partly being a Leo. I think I've always had an affinity with the sun. Mm-hmm. I quite like doing the hermit as well. I've got a bit of hermit in me. <laughs> I feel I feel very hermit like <laughs> at the moment because <laughs> all those spring is springing yeah. or sprunging. Um, it, the weather's we're not been great. For us. Yeah, we're self isolating. Hermiting. The zombie apocalypse is upon us. Mm. Well, I've been getting into cooking, mm. and I've never really baked before. Is this inspired by Bake Off? It's, <laughs> well, kind of. I don't think I'm ready for Bake Off yet, but maybe in... Because um, if you were, we, you know, we'd all be right behind you. Well, I th- I, I, maybe we should do an alternative called The Great British Bake Puff. Um, because I'd rather go for that title than the Bake Off one, because I'm I'm pretty sure I'm not... You know when they do the celebrity ones and they're all a little bit shit? Mm. I think I'd be better on the celebrity Bake Off. (laughs) (laughs) See, whenever they do any of these uh, game shows, the celebrity ones are always a little bit easier, aren't they? And I I feel like... Probably are, yeah. I'm not quite celebrity enough to do that yet, but, you know, maybe if I get there... We could do, like, a sort of... St Paul's Montpellier old market version. We could, we could, <laughs> we could. So I've, but I've, so I baked a cake for Schnack out of it today. Great. And I'm going to go and get it so we can we can try it. My friend um, Susanna Hewlett, who's a performance maker, does a thing called the Great British Shit Off or something, <laughs> and she does like um, replicas of different shits. <laughs> and so people would judge them. Wow. Yeah. Um, Your cake looks nothing like that. Well, there is chocolate on it. Yeah. But um, so m- one of my favourite. Got straight in. One of my favourite cakes is a Boston cake. Now I tried to make a Boston cake, but I was following an American recipe, and they use cups, mm. and we're not really used to the cup system over here. Uh, and um, my measurements all went over the place. Uh, So it was a complete disaster. So this is a bit of a mishmash. So this is a cross between a Boston cake and a Queen Victoria sponge. So this is is unique to us. It's a what that old cream cake. Mm. So it's vanilla sponge with whipped cream in the middle, jam, and then a chocolate ganache on top. That's delicious. And I, this is like my first proper cake that I've ever baked. I think it's really good. It's very moist. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to put the recipe on our website if anyone would like to bake along with Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a cake left over from my 21st, which is a rainbow sort of pride cake. Oh, yeah. I put it in the freezer because someone told me you could do that. Mm. 
So if I do go into sci-fi isolation, I'll just be drink, eating... Rainbow cake. Mm. <laughs> who, who baked that for you? Marks and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> the, after my initial disaster, um, where I got quite stressed out and the air was blue... What did you do with the disaster one? I literally just threw it away. It didn't Aww. bake properly. It was inedible. Um, so, so what do you think? I think it's. I like. I think it's brilliant. It's moist. It's creamy. It's not too sweet. Mm. Um, I added a little bit of vanilla to the sponge. Mm. I think maybe you could have a little bit more. What the what? What kind of vanilla? Like vanilla essence or yeah. Mm. So you and also the cream. I quite like the mishmash of Victoria sponge and. Boston Coat, because Boston Coat has like a patisserie cream, which I did try to make, but it looked a bit beige. What's the history of a Boston cake? Well, it's traditionally made in, it's called a Boston mud pie mm. originally, because you call a dessert what you bake it in. So you originally used to be baked in a pie dish, but it's oh, still okay. a cake. Yeah. But now you kind of bake it as a cake. Mm. I'm quite pleased with this. You should be. I think it. I think it works. So you never know. Maybe if I get a few more of these under my belt. So you're going to try different baking items, or you're going to? I think I'm going to do. Not. We we'll still do snacks, hmm. but we might do like an unusual thing. So this is a fusion of two cakes, which I've made into a unique cake. Hmm. Um, it's like you and me. Yeah, we can then. Yeah, you know, I can. We can try other stuff. Like I quite like to. There's a mealworm recipe, which we could try. <laughs> what is to say? Is that the, the stomach lining? <laughs> <laughs> no, you remember we had the insects. Oh yeah, I think we tried some mealworm chocolate, but you can buy them. There's recipes to make stuff out of them, so it could be like a savoury thing. Oh, okay. Like a stir fry or a pie or something. Do you Check have a cooked a salmon in a dishwasher? <laughs> that, I, I would really love a dishwasher, but I don't have one, so I can't. <laughs> you can't do it in a washing up bowl. Maybe. <laughs> but I'll look keep, into that. Have you, you keep, got a dishwasher? I have, yeah, but I don't like it. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't like anything about washing up. No. I've got a very small sink. Right. So I've been told. <laughs> and it's just always very awkward. It's perfectly formed, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been much admired. Oh. I can imagine. Anyway, that was snack out of it. I just ate the whole thing. What, that old cream cake? Mm. Didn't do the kind of thing that they do on the TV where they just eat, a lovely, like, a little mouthful and then... No, we them. had a big yeah. slab yeah. each. Mm. There weren't any soggy bottoms. No. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. So, yeah, if you want to, as I said, bake along with Bernie, I'll put the recipe up and um, you can try. You say it's going to be your version of it. <laughs> my, It'll be my your, unique your, version. Your unique recipe. Be, I mean, maybe someone else has already done this mm. but and they can just sue me afterwards. But, you know. I don't, I don't think the baking industry's like no. that. I don't think there's people that sue. No. I think, you know, if you just, if you do a fusion of cooking, which I quite like when I'm cooking anyway, you know, you always add a bit and change a bit here, there mm. and everywhere, don't you? Mm. Well, I, well, I do anyway. Yeah. So. Our final section, Queens of Agony, yeah. is back. And as promised, there's a long letter. I'm going to replenish my glass for this moment. Oh, well, I think you probably need to. So, yes, if you could uh, fill mine up. So we've got a really long one, and well, one short one and one really short one, which isn't really a, a problem, it's it's a question. So you are you ready for this? Yeah. So dear old queens. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I've been a, in a pretty serious relationship for more than a year now with a guy I met two years ago. In the first few months, we were just friends. When it came to dating, he kept telling me he was a versatile bottom. He added that he usually tops only three times out of ten. 
I'm totally versatile. Hello. I, I identify with that. I like bottoming just as much as I like topping. We started dating in July and moved in together in December. Seems a bit soon for me. Is that the same year or the year after? Well, they've been together for a year. They've known each other for two years, yeah? Yeah. Mm. Wow. The problem is that he always refuses to top me no matter what. We have sex quite often, but he never wants to top. And when I ask him why he didn't want to top me every once in a while, he just told me that he didn't feel like it and that I was too masculine for him. I don't find this acceptable because I have my own needs as well as he. And he sort of fooled me into thinking that we would fit together sexually. It would be- I think I know who this is from. Do you? (laughs) It would be enough for me if he topped me every 10th time we have sex, but he doesn't. He doesn't even want to hear about, about it, saying I'm too masculine for bottoming, which sounds awfully toxic. He is quite feminine, and I think that if two men are in love, masculinity and femininity doesn't, or at least shouldn't, matter when it comes to satisfying the other one sexually. After all, we aren't dating anymore. We live together. What do you guys advise me to do? Mm. Well, I would say I agree with this person. Like, I feel like this thing about being too masculine to being too masculine to top yeah 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 i think that's a load of crap yeah like and i think that they could just have like if they both have said that they both enjoy that and they should try their best to Mm. like is there another issue that we're not hearing here well i'm reading between the lines Mm. and i feel like they've moved in together too soon Mm. So if you date someone in the July and then move in with them in December, mm. which is what, five months later? Mm. That's quite a big move. Mm. And you're probably still getting to know someone and whether you are sexually compatible. Mm. I mean, but I don't think it's the end of their relationship. I think they just... They could move out and then just it in different ways. Or what do you think? Well, maybe. I, well, I feel like this is... <clears throat> I don't know what to say for this one. As always, communication is key, isn't it? Mm. I think. And I think he really needs to talk to his partner a little bit more about this without being accusatory, because it feels like he's quite accusatory, where like he's been fooled into thinking that they're sexually compatible and they're mm. not. I'm assuming they're monogamous as well, so maybe they shouldn't be? Well, I was thinking that it was going to go that way. Yeah. So I thought that that was what... But then I guess he would have solved his own problem if he would have been exploring other avenues with other people. Yeah, I mean, I think if they can't... If they only want to be monogamous, then there's obviously an issue here. They need to communicate and, you know, work out what they can do with each other sexually, Mm. which is going to fulfil both of them. It just seems very antiquated and kind of a little bit sad that you're forced into these positions that you can't be one thing or another Mm. i mean i've got preferences but you know in with the right person and you want to do what you know if you're you if you're if you're in love with that person or even if you just really like that person you want to make them feel like they are enjoying something as well. Yeah, definitely. Also, I <clears throat> I kind of identify with this guy because I always seemed... I tend to have to top more because people see me as a masculine guy, mm. whether they're versatile or not. Mm. Do you think it's something to do with being older as well? Yeah, definitely. Do they say what their ages are? No, that wasn't included in the letter. What is great about that letter is the font is really nice and big. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have put it in that big font, <laughs> even though I've got my very focus. Yeah, your on. very focus are working well. The very tonight. focus are working. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you do send us a question, if they could be in big font, that would be amazing. <laughs> Caps. <laughs> um, so, what do we advise this person? So, we to advise. Do? I think we advise more communication. Yeah, getting to the bottom <laughs> of what this is. Like, well, I think your partner has to get, 
has to meet you halfway here somehow. Mm. I want to know what their view of relationships are more generally, really. Yeah. It feels like it's following quite a sort of normative view of, like, how there's one thing or the other. Yeah, it's quite heteronormative, Mm. isn't it? Yeah. And it feels like that if, if his partner can't step up to the mark and kind of fulfil him in a way that maybe he needs to get that satisfaction from elsewhere mm. you know because I think a lot of people who are in relationships mm. do have that they love their mm. partner but there are certain things sexually that they can't fulfil so um, so they they find that fulfilment elsewhere can I just say two words mm. um, power bottoming <laughs> it's this would this be a good way to combat? Yeah. I mean, what do you mean by power bottoming? Could he assert his dominance by being more of a power bottom mm. in the first instant yeah. so that he, that, so that this partner that has got a sort of slightly dodgy role view of mm. passive and dominance and feminine and masculine... Mm could sort of see him through a different prism sexually yeah yeah also yeah also power bottoming is a step in the in the right direction and maybe a bit of role play Mm. would work Mm. as well because you know maybe if you're pretending to be something you're not it might help how about just removing the bottom from the bedroom (laughs) (laughs) there are other orifices there are yes yeah, there's lots of other th- stuff you could be doing. Just or, for a moment, like as a stepping stone. Yeah. Let's not... Yeah, let's let's remove the anal. Mm. Um, don't be anal about anal. Mm. Um, and... Um, or, you know, invite a third in. Might be able to satisfy both of you. Are you angling for an invitation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if these people know me. So it's, it's all anon- an- anonymous. Um, there's a lot of communication which needs to be mm. done here and maybe a rethinking of roles mm. and l- we don't have to be heteronormative because we're gay mm. you know so but power bottoming could be a segue power b- <laughs> and if you are a power bottom <laughs> please do <laughs> drop us a line <laughs> and tell us your experience of that uh, so should we move on to question two? Well, I think that might be one. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not going to drop you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, move on to question two. We'll move on to question two. We can talk about power bottoming. <laughs> Tommy's power bottom workshops <laughs> <laughs> can be in another episode. Right. So this is an odd one. Um, dear old queens, I seem to notice a trend with straight girls whenever they bring their boyfriends or husbands around to a a gay friend for the first... A gay friend. (laughs) That would be me. (laughs) A grey gay friend. Uh, For the first time. They get overly friendly, touchy and extra with you for no reason Mm. in front of their guys, which gives me severe anxiety because in my head I'm like, I hope she told him I was gay, LOL. So, I then feel forced to announce I'm gay in the situation, and then all of a sudden, the boyfriend, stroke husband, stroke the husband, gets that look of relief and wants to be best friends. I'm wondering if you old queens have gone through this. Not like that, no. I don't think so. Mm. Like, there are straight women that that are sort of over familiar and touchy mm. with me. Yeah. Um, because I think they see me as, uh, as not threatening. Yeah, it's a very safe... Yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem to play out when they are with their partners. I've not observed that. Right. Um, no, that feels quite different. It feels, it feels a bit odd that yeah. the, the, they're doing... Maybe this person is reading too much into it. Or maybe the 
That girlfriend or wife is just enjoying being flirty and tactile with another man in front of her partner. Right. Because it's the sort of, like, maybe she's getting some kind of pleasure from um, sort of a titillation of a, like, potential menage a trois. Oh. But that's very imaginative. Like, that's not... There's nowhere near in the realms of a realisation. Right. But it's a playful way to explore that idea. They're playing with swinging. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the safest possible context. Yeah. Or just trying to make their boyfriend jealous. In yeah. a safe way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think... But have ever... they asked for any <laughs> advice on that? Well, no, they just said. Uh, I'm wondering whether you've you've gone through that. I oh, guess yeah, yeah. whether mm. they they're asking. I guess they are asking advice mm. as to what to do. But mm. I think they're doing the right thing by proclaiming their, proclaiming their yeah. gaydom, yeah, and uh, and maybe not playing along with it, or maybe do play along with it if you fancy the boyfriend. Fancy the boyfriend, yeah. Mm. I know. mean, that probably would put the nose out of joint of the friend that's a girl, yeah. Um, and maybe she wouldn't do it again. Yeah. Why don't? Yeah. Why don't you just turn the tables and just be overly flirty with the boyfriend? Like he hasn't actually specified whether he finds it sort of uncomfortable. Or well, I think he's he feels uncomfortable because he gets severe anxiety. Oh yeah. Because in my head, he feels like the boyfriend is feeling jealous yeah. of him. Yeah. So in that case, I would say that you need to have a quiet word with, with a girlfriend. Yeah. And just say, you know, when you came around last night, you f- it felt a little bit like you were flirting with me in front of your boyfriend. And I wanted to just unpick that with you. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, our friendship is very important to us. If it is, I'm sure it probably is if they're coming around. Um, and it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. And just be really open and honest about yeah. that. Or do mm. you want a threesome? Yeah. That's the answer. Two, yeah. <laughs> There's two options. Or, 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 or all, all those options. Yeah. See how, let us know how you get on. Yeah. <laughs> Does the menage a trois mm. happen? Mm. <laughs> right. Our final question is about another, it's a threesome thing. Oh, yeah. It is all about threesomes, mm. these questions, aren't they? Um, maybe we should have spoken about that earlier in, well, in it's, Kinky Bling. It's, um, I think we've, we have, we've touched on it before, haven't we? I think we have yeah. touched on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, dear old queens, if you were given the chance to have a threesome with your two celebrity crushes, who would you choose? Oh. Andy Peters. You've got a thing about Andy oh, Peters, God, haven't you? Yeah. What attracts you to the millionaire Andy Peters? <laughs> <laughs> Just like he's so, bu- like he's really worked out. Mm. He's kind of buff. Yeah. Like there's something about him that he's really clean cut. You know, yeah. he like I follow him on Instagram. He's always at the gym. Right. And he's so kind of like annoyingly cheerful and like wholesome mm. but i just know that there's something filthy underneath oh there always yeah. is isn't there yeah. it's always the quiet i mean he's always been very discreet about what his sexuality is really even though everyone knows for sure well yeah i mean he's blatantly gay right he works for lorraine <laughs> i mean you <laughs> maybe that's the next person in the threesome because I can't a... think of my next person <laughs> <laughs> there has to be someone that you well there's a guy that is in lots of films oh, tell me yours and I'll come back to it because I need to google oh, what his name God, is there's so many I mean currently Tom Hardy would have to be one of them because he is ridiculously hot um, and I've always had a massive crush on a young Sean Connery. Yeah, actually, when you go a bit more further back, Tony Curtis could be a good one for Yeah, me. totally. Yeah. He's gorgeous. And that links in with our, what? That really old queen. That really old queen, because we're going we're gonna to be touching on film stars and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I imagine that a, a threesome with a young Sean Connery and a Tom Hardy would be mm. ridiculously hot. Do you watch Silent Witness? Yes. Do you like Jack? Jack. <laughs> <laughs> he's Remind me like, who Jack is so in Silent Witness. He's always like boxing. Um, there he is, looking moody. Oh, yeah. Yes. And Silent Witness, for me, is like... Because, like, that's what I did in January a lot, because, like, they always put it on in January. You were a silent witness. I just love that show, you know, and all of those characters feel so familiar to me, like they're mm-hmm. old friends. It's a bit, It's like a modern-day Quincy, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Uh, or, you know, um, Crime Scene Investigation. It's a British version of that, yeah. isn't it? So I do love a murder. I love it, like, a, just a dead body on a slab. <laughs> <laughs> what did I watch the other day? Faye Dunaway mm. and a beautiful younger version of Tommy Lee Jones in the eyes of Laura Mars. Do you remember that movie? It's the 70s. No. The soundtrack is amazing. I'm going to write that down. It, it's New York in the... So it's, they're currently... It's repeated several times a week on Sony Classic Movies. Um, other movie channels are available. Uh, Laura, Eyes of Laura Mars, and she is a um, like a f- fashion artist photographer, mm-hmm. Faye Dunaway, and but she has these psychic experiences where she sees through the eyes of a serial killer, mm-hmm. and some of the photographs she's done are scenes from murders, which um, which have happened, unsolved murders which have happened. And so the police are kind of investigating her because they think she might be the killer. Mm. Um, I mean, it's it's a bit cheesy because it's the seventies, and when all of a sudden she goes into this weird starey mode, and it's like some weird out of focus seeing it a scene brilliant. through the killer's eyes. But it's amazing, and it's set in seventies New York. There's lots of beautiful people in it, and models, and the disco soundtrack is amazing. Mm. So um, it's a top tip. So that I mean that. That almost mentions one of our other new features, what what that old movie. Yeah. So there you go, that's that's our tip. But yours feel very like no diss mm. on you, but they are quite out of reach. Be- mm. They're like either quite far back in time or mm. like Hollywood. Yeah. Mine actually You feel feel yours are achievable, don't well, you? Well I don't feel they're <laughs> achievable. But I have had messages from Andy Peters on Instagram right. when I've messaged him. Okay. Just because he says, Does anyone want a shout out? And I did say that I did want one. I thought you were gonna say, Does anyone want a shag? <laughs> no, a shout out. A shout out. Yeah. Okay. And Jack from Silent Witness um, Has he shouted out to you? No, he's well. never shouted out to me. But I do know one of the other actors in Silent Witness. Right. Like, I have met them. They're, like... There's, like, two degrees of separation. Yeah, they're my friend on Facebook. Okay. All right. So, well, let me have a think about this, and I, I might think of some more no, because uh, No, because I'm thinking that my, I should go higher. Well, maybe, but I don't, I don't know. I think the whole thing was... It's fantasy. Mm. So it's kind of unobtainium. Yeah, isn't it? Sure. Some people in a relationship they have that they have a thing, don't they? If they're in a monogamous relationship, I think they've done this in Friends yeah. or something. Yeah, where they've said if if it's if it's Catherine Deneuve turns up, if Catherine Deneuve yeah. turns up and they want to sleep with yeah. you, you're allowed to do it. Yeah. So if you were in a monogamous relationship, who out of Andy Peters or the guy from Silent Witness. Silent Witness would be your what out of the two? Yeah, because it's because it started off as being a threesome. Well, it did, I know, it but we've, it's kind of it's, it's kind not of, fair. <laughs> You're not playing by the rules. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can have two. <laughs> there are no rules, Tom. <laughs> we we only put restrictions on ourselves. I'm going to go with Jack because I think that's. Like you said, like you say, it is a fantasy, and I don't like. Yeah, I think it's extremely unlikely that Andy Peters would ever find me sexually attractive or interested in me. But it's even more so that Jack would. But uh, but also, Andy Peters is gay. So yours are kind of more obtainable than mine because I think mine, both of mine, are straight. Mm. And there's another thing with with gay men where they 
once they find out someone's straight, so maybe they're lusting after someone, not a famous person, mm. but they're lusting after someone within their realm. And then as soon as they find out they're straight, they're instantly turned off mm. of that. Are you like that? or Because it's so, unobtainable, you, you, you get rid of the crush. I don't tend to find straight people attractive like sexually attractive in that way mm. it's just something about Jack and the way that his character is in that show really yeah so um, it's more a fictional character yeah, rather than a fiction, a, an actual yeah, real person yeah, yeah yeah I've had that where I've fallen in love with someone like a character from a book mm. um, what was the book oh it was when I was so I think there's been a number of books over the years but when I, when I was a kid <laughs> I used to read these fantasy books called the Dragonlance Chronicles mm. And there was uh, a bearded elf. I think he was called Tannis. And for some reason, I completely fancied him. Like, he, I just imagined him and he mm. was just really attractive and just the type of guy that I would go for. Mm. Um, and kind of... I still... F I actually... But just talking about it, I st I'm getting butterflies because I still feel quite attracted to that character. It's kind of crazy. I like that idea. But it's weird when you when you fantasize about fictional characters because mm. I but so have I ever told you about my superman fetish? No. So when I when I was a kid, I had um so I've always had a thing for superman and it's not the character that mm. it's not the actor that's playing superman, it is actually superman. Mm. I went to see Superman when I was like 7 or 8. Yeah, Superman the movie with Christopher Reeves in. And when I got home, I just couldn't sleep all night. I was because, and I, at the time, when you're that age, you don't really know what straight or gay is, mm. do you? I mean, it's just like you don't really know what those mm. feelings are. And um, I, I got home and I couldn't sleep all night, and I was tossing and turning. And then, and I thought it's because I was in love with Lois Lane, who was Margot Kidder, who I actually was. I used to love that. The actor that played her, yeah. Mm. So her Margot Kidder yeah. was amazing, yeah, sorry, yeah. and she's in a she's in a great horror movie mm. called Twins, I think. She's amazing in that because mm. she plays the two roles, and one of them's a mm. like a psychotic murderer. Anyway, uh, but I thought, yeah, I thought it was Lois Lane, but then when I woke up in the morning, I realised it was Superman. Mm. And ever since then, I've always had this thing for Superman. How often? Do you listen to Laurie Anderson's Oh Superman? Which is a very sexual pop song. It just made me think of that because it's such got such long longing in it. Yeah. And it's so like... Because we were talking about this at this dinner party with a load of academics on Saturday. And, and, she, and this woman said, you know, sometimes I just get students in a room and I just play them Laurie Anderson's Oh Superman. And they just get it all. Like, totally. from that one song. Laurie Anderson's amazing. Like, the futuristic that. elements and the kind of creative technology and the kind of... It's just so groundbreaking, but so pop as well. So pop and mm. also really sexual. Mm. That whole beat, the... Mm. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Oh, Superman, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> I mean, it's on repeat. It's it's actually my alarm clock in the morning. Yeah, it would be a really good alarm clock, wouldn't it? But you probably just want to stay in bed. Well, with Superman, but unfortunately, he's hardly ever there. Um, and on that note, we'll put a link in the description to Laurie Anderson's Oh Superman via Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening. It's the end of our show, of our first series. Oh, it's so much fun uh, to be back. Uh, for, uh, first show in the second series, sorry. And um, there's more to come. And um, please like, share, subscribe. Um, drop us a line. Who are you? your two famous uh, people that you'd like to have a threesome with? Yeah, and we also want to know problems. Yeah. We want problems. So, And if you can include a long letter, um, Tommy will be very happy. Mm. <laughs> anyway thank you Tommy thank you. and thank you listeners and we will see you next time thanks for bringing that lovely cake well let's see what I can bake next time right
can't wait. I'll bake along with Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. We'll see you next time on What That Old Queen. Say goodbye, Tommy. Goodbye, Tommy. Goodbye. You have been listening to What That Old Queen, written and presented by Tom Marshman and Bernie Hodges. The show was produced by Bernie Hodges in spring 2020 for Hodge Podcasting. If you would like to sponsor this show, or you'd like to be a guest, or you just have a question for the old queens, you can email at hello at thatoldqueen.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. <laughs>